realized after Monday, I let you know what I had calculated as far as the time use was concerned. Um, I, I think I was a little bit off yesterday, but I also don't think it's going to be an issue. Um, I don't think we're going to be finding ourselves coming up on that 14 hour limit for either side. So I, I calculated two hours, 19 minutes with plaintiffs and one hour, 44 minutes for defendants yesterday. So like I said, I, I don't think we're going to be running into any problems. Uh, the plaintiffs are ready with your next witness. Plaintiffs call Dr. Frank Baumgartner. Uh, Dr. Baumgartner, if you would come around um, behind that column, sir, and Mr. Pettit will show you where to sit. Right here, sir. If you would, just remain standing and raise your right arm. You saw the testimony you're about to give this court. Show me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing about the truth, and this is your solemn application. Yes, I do. Thank you. Have a seat, sir. I'm going to poke this up to you. Okay. Uh, if you want to check out where you want it. Your Honor, yes. it looks like the screen is not on. Is that correct? Yes, sir. If not, we'll adjust it. But I don't think it's mine showing it on. Um, there, there, there. I think it's just warming up for a moment. Okay. Um, let's see. Dr. Baumgartner, do you have uh, water over there? I, I have, have a cup of water. Okay. Thank you. Um, and, sir, given that you are at least six feet from everyone else in the courtroom, if you are comfortable removing your mask, I would invite you to do that. It's just easier for everyone to hear your testimony. If you prefer to leave it on, that's fine. Um, but if you're comfortable removing it, which I see you've done. Um, also, as the attorneys are asking their questions, please speak clearly, slowly, and loud enough for the court reporter to hear you take down what you're saying and swear for counsel. The acoustics aren't the best here, so if you'll just try to project your voice. When the attorneys finish their questions, please go ahead and do that before you start answering. The court reporter can't take down two people talking at the same time. And finally, if you have a yes or no answer, sir, you would answer out loud with yes or no. Okay, right. thank you. All right, thank you. Whenever you're ready. Good morning, Dr. Baumgartner. Good morning. Would you please state your full name for the record? My name is Frank R. Baumgartner. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 2, please? Dr. Baumgartner, do you recognize this as a copy of your current CV? Yes, I do. And what is your educational background starting with college? Um, I attended the University of Michigan for my bachelor's degree and graduated in 1980 and then stayed on for my master's and PhD in political science in 1983 and 1986, all from the University of Michigan. Where are you currently employed and what titles do you hold there? I'm currently employed at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and I hold the Richard J. Richardson Distinguished Professorship in Political Science and I'm an adjunct professor of public policy. How long have you taught at UNC? I've taught at UNC since 2009. Have you won any awards for your academic work? Yes, I've won several awards for uh, Lifetime Achievement, Best Book Awards, Best Database Awards. I could mention a few of them in particular. My book, uh, Suspect Citizens, about racial disparities and traffic stop outcomes in North Carolina, based on 20 million traffic stops since 2002, won the Best Book Award from the American Political Science Association section on law and courts. That was the most recent award. I won, I think, six book awards altogether. And have you also won uh, awards from UNC for your teaching? I was named, uh, I think, best graduate student mentor uh, at UNC by the political science department. Have you been elected as a member of any honorary societies? Yes, I was elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is an organization that goes back, I think, to 1789. Can you briefly describe your current areas of academic focus? I work on uh, the nature of change in public policy in general, but in particular in the, re the last 10 years I've focused especially on racial disparities and criminal justice outcomes, 
with a focus on North Carolina, uh, but also uh, some work nationwide, especially in the area of the death penalty. Focusing in particular on criminal justice, do you currently teach any courses related to criminal justice? Yes, I do. I'll be starting a course tomorrow. Uh, it's the first day of class, and then in the spring I also teach another large lecture class about the death penalty. And if we scroll down to your list of publications in your CV, can you identify works you've published related to criminal justice? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. I think if we start uh, with the work uh, published as books, authored books, which is on page three of my CV, uh, the book Suspect Citizens, What 20 Million Traffic Stops Tell Us About Policing and Race, is about the North Carolina criminal justice system, or at least the traffic stop aspect of it. Deadly Justice, a statistical portrait of the death penalty, which was published in 2018, is a nationwide study of the death penalty. And if we move on to uh, articles published in peer review journals, um, I have the most, uh, all of the most recent articles that I've published have been about criminal justice and race. Throwing Away the Key, uh, Better for Everyone, Black Descriptive Representation on Police Traffic Stops, At the Intersection, Race, Gender, and Discretion in Police Traffic Stop Outcomes, Fines, Fees, and Disparities, The Link Between Municipal Reliance on Fines and Racial Disparities um, in Policing, Intersectional Encounters, Representative Bureaucracy and the Routine Traffic Stop, and several of the other articles published in the last two or three years also relate to racial just a racial difference in criminal justice outcomes. And how about articles published in law reviews? Did any of those relate to criminal justice? Well, almost every article in the law review that I publish relates to criminal justice. Um, I have one forthcoming in the Southern University Law Review about race and gender disparities in capital cases in Louisiana. Um, an article published in 2017 in the Duke Forum for Law and Social Change relates to traffic stop outcomes and racial disparities. An article in the Albany Law Review in 2016 relates to um, gender and racial differences in the application of the death penalty. Uh, and so forth. Almost every article in law reviews is related to, obviously, law and criminal justice. You mentioned your book and articles on traffic stop data in North Carolina. Can you briefly describe what your findings have been there? Yes, very briefly. Um, we found that black North Carolinians are about twice as likely as whites to be pulled over in a routine traffic stop based on their share of the population. And once pulled over, they're about twice as likely to be subjected to a search of their, their vehicle or their person compared to white drivers, roughly speaking. Are you currently undertaking any research of North Carolina criminal justice data? Yes, I'm involved in several projects. Uh, one in particular relates to the history of North Carolina's use of the death penalty in modern times uh, since the Furman decision going up to present time. And the second major book project relates to an analysis of 8 million arrest records using the North Carolina Administrative Office of the Courts data on every person arrested in North Carolina since 2013. Have you taught statistical methods of analysis in any of your courses? Yes, uh, many of my courses and most of my research relates to statistical analysis and many of my courses make use of that as well. Have you employed statistical analysis in your published works? Almost all of my published research uh, uses statistical uh, research methods. Specifically, have you performed statistical analysis of racial disparities in the criminal justice system as part of your published works? Yes, most of the, if not all of the articles that I've just mentioned relate to statistical analyses of racial difference in criminal justice outcomes. Have you ever testified as an expert witness before? I have. And how many times? 
Uh, this is just my second appearance in court as an expert giving courtroom testimony, and I've also testified sometimes through written uh, uh, offerings to courts. What was the other case where you testified live? Um, it was a case a year or two ago in Oregon, uh, Guzek, uh, the Oregon, I think it's called. Uh, anyway, it was a, an appeal of a capital sentence for an individual who was on death row in Oregon, who was uh, just over 18 years old at the time of the crime. Did the court there accept you as qualified to provide expert opinion testimony? Yes, it did. And you mentioned uh, that you've submitted written expert reports in other cases, even if you didn't testify or haven't testified yet, at least. Can you briefly describe those? Uh, just recently, earlier this year, I provided a long written report um, uh, for a case in Pennsylvania reviewing the uh, various kinds of disparities and differences in the application of the death penalty in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, and I, I want to, I don't want to um, err, so let me just check. On page 14 of my CV, which is on the, in the exhibit, um, I, I gave an affidavit in two cases here in Wake County regarding capital jury selection in those two cases. Um, and I, um, I provided testimony in a written form uh, in a case in Louisiana in East Baton Rouge Paris about the application of the death penalty in that parish of Louisiana. Have courts or judges cited your research in any other cases, even if you didn't participate as an expert in the case? And I'll draw your attention to pages 21 to 22 of your CV, if that helps to remind. Could you just tell us about those? Uh, yes, um, occasionally uh, courts, either state Supreme Courts or the U.S. Supreme Court has made reference to some of my research and their published opinions. In the Oregon Supreme Court in 2019, they referred to my research on traffic stops in, in a ruling limiting um, questioning following a traffic stop only to the topic, the, the, the illegal behavior of the individual who may have made an illegal right turn. And the, the, the Oregon um, Supreme Court cited my research on that. The Arizona Supreme Court has used my research on geographical disparities and the application of the death penalty. And the United States Supreme Court has uh, referred to my research also on the death penalty. And the Iowa Supreme Court has used my research um, on traffic stops and some of its rulings as well, or at least one of my one of its rulings. Dr. Baumgartner, are you charging any fees for your expert work in this case? No, I'm volunteering my time. Thank you. Your Honors, at this time we tender Dr. Baumgartner as an expert in political science, public policy, statistics, and the intersection of race and the criminal justice system. No objection from legislative guidance. No objection. The court will accept Dr. Baumgartner as an expert in the field of political science, public policy, statistics, and the intersection of race and the criminal justice system. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 1, which is Dr. Baumgartner's opening report in this case? Dr. Baumgartner, you were asked to evaluate several issues in this case. What was the first issue plaintiffs asked you to evaluate? The first issue is laid out on page 3 of my report. And then the first question was the number of persons on probation or post-release supervision who are currently disenfranchised. And I was asked to look at that at the statewide level and also county by county. And we'll get into the details in a little, a little while, but just broadly speaking, how did you go about answering that question? Broadly speaking, <coughs> excuse me, I looked at, uh, I received databases from the state through the plaintiffs, and I analyzed those to count up how many people 
were disenfranchised under these policies. And uh, were those databases from the North Carolina Department of Public Safety? Yes, they were. And did you also review data from the federal government about people on probation from North Carolina federal court convictions? Yes, I did. And again, just broadly speaking, what were your findings on that first question about the number of persons on community supervision who are currently disenfranchised? Well, generally speaking, after eliminating duplicates, the same person kind of twice, uh, we found, or I found, that there were more than 51,000 individuals disenfranchised under these policies under state law, and an additional 5,000 people, roughly speaking, who were disenfranchised under federal law. And how about at the county level, just broadly, what was your finding? We found that every county has a racial disparity in the rate of blacks being disenfranchised uh, compared to the rate of whites being disenfranchised. And that was ubiquitous throughout the state of North Carolina. What's the second question plaintiffs asked you to analyze? That was the racial demographics of persons on probation or post-release supervision who are currently disenfranchised at the statewide and the county levels. And again, broadly, how did you go about answering that question? The same databases that we received from the Department of Public Safety uh, included uh, the race of the individual on probation or under post-release supervision. So we aggregated the numbers of whites, blacks, Native Americans, Asians, Asian Americans, uh, county by county, and counted up the number of people compared that to the population. And did you use federal census data to uh, pull North Carolina population demographic information? We used the most recent data available from the U.S. Census to get the number of adults uh, of voting age population by race for each of the counties and statewide. And again, broadly, what were your findings on the second question related to racial demographics of individuals on community supervision? Very broadly, the number of African Americans um, on, um, who were disenfranchised was about double their share of the population. And the number of whites was greatly reduced as a share of those disenfranchised compared to their share in the population. So there was a very stark and consistent racial disparity. Dr. Baumgartner, I'm not going to ask any detailed questions today about the third issue you analyzed because it's already been resolved in this case, but just briefly, what was that third issue? The third issue was the amount of financial obligations owed by persons on probation or post-release supervision um, who were currently disenfranchised. And again, without getting into the details, just briefly, what did you find? Your Honor, I would just like to lodge an objection to the line of question you were going to find. If these councils already indicated it's not part of this trial, so even broadly stroking it doesn't make any sense. This is my last question about it. it it's in his report, which will be moving into evidence so for context. And objections overall, you Very broadly speaking, we found that people owe a lot of money. Thank you. We're going to skip the fourth question that you analyzed. Can you tell us what's the fifth and final question you were asked to analyze in this case? I was asked to look at uh, recent elections where the vote margin in the election that separated the winning candidate from the losing candidate who had the next largest number of votes was less than the number of people disenfranchised in the relevant constituency. And again, broadly, how did you go about answering that question? Well, to answer that question, I looked at vote margins across different elections where we had data by county or statewide because the data that we received about the disenfranchisement rates was either statewide or we could do it county by county. So I found elections that corresponded to those two geographical uh, units and then looked for essentially close elections. And I identified all the elections where the vote margin between the winning and the losing candidate was less than the number of people disenfranchised in that geographical unit, whether it was a county or statewide. And broadly, what were your findings on this question? 
Well, I found a number of elections where uh, there was a greater number of people disenfranchised, sometimes many times greater number disenfranchised than the vote margin that separated the winning candidate from the losing candidate. Dr. Baumgartner, I'd like to now go into more detail on the first question you analyzed, the overall number of people disenfranchised in North Carolina due to community supervision. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 3, which is Table 1 from Dr. Baumgartner's report? Starters, in broad terms, what is this table showing? In broad terms, this table shows a summary of the work that I did to move from the data that was received from the State Department of Public Safety um, to the database that I actually analyzed in order to reach my conclusion. Okay, let's break that down. Looking at the first column labeled post-release supervision request for production to, what does that refer to? Well, the file that we, that our, that we, that we received from the state included 17,621 rows of data. Uh, so that was the first, uh, and that was related to the people who were under post-release supervision. How about that second column labeled probation request for production three? What does that refer to? Well, that's a description of the spreadsheet that we received from the state uh, in response to request for production number three, which was individuals on probation. There were 62,243 rows in that spreadsheet. Okay. So you described the first row there and the numbers of the, from the file as received from the state. How about the second row labeled minus multiple charges for the same individual? What do the two numbers in that row represent? Well, the same individual may have been on post-release supervision or probation because of multiple charges. And so in order to reach uh, an answer of how many people are affected by these policies, we wanted to count each person only once. So there is an identifying number, and the name of the person was included in the database as well as their ethnicity, race, and gender. So we eliminated duplicate charges for the same person, counting only one charge. So these numbers represent how many additional charges, the second charge, a third charge, a fourth charge, and so on, for the same individual who also, uh, who was already there with the first charge. And how about that third row labeled subtotal? What's that? Uh, well, if you subtract 5,245 from 17,000, 621, I believe you'll come up with 12,376, so it's simply the, the subtraction of one or the other. It's the number of unique individuals rather than uh, char total charges. So that row shows the number of unique individuals in each of the spreadsheets on post-release supervision or probation in North Carolina from a felony conviction? That's right. We found just over 40,000 individuals on probation and 12,000 and some on um, post-release supervision, unique individuals. Okay. Skipping over one row, what does the row labeled observations appearing in both databases represent? It represents the number of people who are in both databases, so that the same person uh, may have been on probation, but also under post-release supervision, and we didn't want to count people twice, so we took some care to identify those who appeared in both, both databases so that we could have a full count that counted each person only once of those who were unable to vote because of either one of these two policies, not to double count them. So these are the people who appear twice who would need, one of those observations would need to be deleted to get to the accurate count of the total number of people affected by these policies. Okay, looking now at the far right column labeled combined data set. Can you describe the calculation you did there and the ultimate conclusion you reached? Well, the calculation is very simple. It's just to take the total number of individuals and to eliminate the duplicates and to come up with a, a final count of how many uh, unique individual people are affected by these policies. 
So after subtracting the multiple charges for the same person and subtracting the people who might appear under both uh, in both databases, I came up with 51,441 individuals who are disenfranchised because of these policies. So based on this table, the total number of individuals disenfranchised due to post-release supervision or probation from a North Carolina state court felony conviction is 51,441 people? That's right, 51,441 people are disenfranchised because of these state policies. Does that figure represent all of the individuals who are disenfranchised in North Carolina due to a felony conviction, uh, su community supervision, or does it exclude certain people? It does, it's not a complete number. It includes only the people under uh, serving under state convictions or following from state convictions, and it excludes people, uh, some other people. And who are those other people? The people not included here would be people serving uh, under probation or post-release supervision from federal convictions, uh, where we know the number. Uh, uh, but also people who might reside in North Carolina who are unable to vote because of convictions uh, from other states. Did you analyze the number of people who are on community supervision from a felony conviction in North Carolina federal court? Yes, I did. And what did you conclude? That number was just over 5,000 individuals in addition to the 51,000 uh, 441 represented in Table 1, there were an additional 5,000 people who were unable to vote because they had a federal conviction. And was the specific number 5,075 people on community supervision from a North Carolina federal court conviction? Uh, I believe that was the right number, and if it's in my report, I would stand by that number. I, I don't have it at the top of my head. What source did you rely on to uh, make that determination? Well, the federal courts uh, have a database online, a website, where one can look this up. And so we looked it up using the most recent information available at the time from the federal website that makes it available. Dr. Baumgartner, if you combine those uh, 5,075 people on supervision from a federal court conviction in North Carolina with the 51,441 people we discussed previously on supervision from a North Carolina state court conviction. How many people did you determine are disenfranchised due to community supervision from a felony conviction in North Carolina state or federal court? Well, between those two, uh, it would be just over 56,000 individuals. And I could look up the exact number, but it's over 56,000. Does 56,516 sound familiar? That sounds very familiar uh, from my report, yes. What about people living in North Carolina who are on community supervision from a felony conviction in another state? Did you receive data on those people? I did not receive data from, uh, related to those people. Did you make any attempt to quantify them? No, I did not. We've been talking uh, about the number of people disenfranchised due to community supervision across the entire state. Did you also analyze how many people are disenfranchised in individual counties across North Carolina? Yes, I did. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 7, which is figure 3 from Dr. Baumgartner's report? This, uh, this bar graph down into pieces, but just broadly, what is this figure looking at? This figure is looking at the 100 counties of North Carolina and giving a summary of how many counties have different levels of disenfranchisement of their local populations without regard to race. What does the horizontal axis going from left to right represent? It represents the percentage of the local population in that county, a voting age, the voting age, the percentage of the voting age population in that county who are disenfranchised under the policies that we're describing, uh, that we're discussing here today, and it's only the state 
uh, cases, the 51,000, does not include the federal cases. What do the gray vertical bars in the chart represent? Those represent the number of counties that have the corresponding uh, level of disenfranchisement or rate of disenfranchisement of their adult population. Okay, let's take an example. How about the gray bar on the far left side of the chart? What does that gray bar tell us? Well, that gray bar has a height equal to seven, so that indicates that there are seven counties that have the corresponding rate of disenfranchisement. And if you read down at the bottom, that rate of disenfranchisement is approximately one quarter of 1%, 0.25. So there are seven counties in North Carolina where that's the rate of uh, disenfranchisement. And that means that there are seven counties where 0.25% of the total voting age population in that county is disenfranchised due to community supervision? That's right. These are these rates of disenfranchisement I'll take the entire group of those disenfranchised and compare it to the entire population of voting age population of the entire voting age population in that county without regard to race. One more example. How about the gray bar all the way on the far right? What does that tell us? The furthest right bar uh, has a height of one, which indicates that there's just one county with that rate of disenfranchisement. <laughs> And it's at approximately 1.4, so that means that that's the rate at which adults, uh, voting age adults in that county are disenfranchised, 1.4% of the population can't vote. If you stacked all the gray bars in this chart on top of each other, how high would they go? Well, they would go exactly to 100 because there's 100 counties in North Carolina. Uh, so each uh, county is represented by a part of one of those bars. And just to be clear, this chart is showing the rate of disenfranchisement of the entire voting age population in each county, not specific to any racial demographic. Is that correct? That is correct. This is the, the, the global rate of disenfranchisement of the adult population in each county. There are two vertical lines in the table one on the left that's labeled lower than 0.48, and one on the right labeled higher than 0.83. What do those lines represent? Well, those are lines that separate what you might call the low, medium, and high categories of disenfranchisement, and they're empirically derived. That is to say, the middle category includes 50 observations. Those are the 50 counties in the center of the distribution. The low category includes the 25 counties with the lowest rates of disenfranchisement, and the high uh, category, uh, where the barrier is, or the, the boundary is 0 0.83, that's simply the boundary that separates the top 25 counties from the bottom 75. So the, the bins or the categories, the low, medium, and high, were simply defined as the 25th percentile, the middle 50, and the upper 25. There's nothing other. Uh, that, so the, the, the boundaries are the, the, um, the cut points, 0 0.48 and 0 0.83, simply divide the uh, counties based on the distribution so that 50% are in the middle, 25 are in the low category, and 25 are in the high category. OK, and we'll get to some of this later, but did you use those same cut points lower bound of uh, below 0.48 and higher than 0.83 to categorize disenfranchisement rates in individual counties as low, medium, and high in other parts of your report? Yes, I did. Looking at this chart, how many counties have a disenfranchisement rate above 1% of the total voting age population? And I can refer you to page 10 of your report. It's helpful to I believe the number is nine counties uh, have one percent of the population disenfranchised or more than one percent of the population disenfranchised, just nine counties. So that means that in those nine counties, more than one percent of the entire voting age population is disenfranchised due to community supervision from a felony conviction? That's right, uh, or probation. Yeah. What are those nine counties? And again, if you uh, want to refer to page 10 of your report. Excuse me. Uh, 
excuse me while I fumble and get to page 10. Those counties, uh, as it says on page 10 of the report, are Cleveland County, uh, McDowell County, Pamlico County, Beaufort County, Madison County, Sampson County, Duplin County, Lincoln County, and Scotland counties, all of which have a rate of disenfranchisement of more than 1% of their local adult population. I'd like to turn now to the second issue you analyzed involving the racial demographics of the population who are disenfranchised due to community supervision from a felony conviction. Did you analyze racial demographics of this disenfranchised population on a statewide basis or in individual counties? I analyzed um, it both at the statewide level and county by county. Let's start with your statewide analysis. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 4, which is Table 2 from Dr. Baumgart Dr. Baumgartner's report? And we'll get into the details, but just broadly, what is this table looking at? What's the subject matter? Subject matter here is the total population by race in North Carolina, and then the number of individuals who are disenfranchised under these policies. Starting with the first column on the left, labeled N under population, what does that column represent? That represents the number of people a voting age uh, population in each of the racial groups. What about the next column labeled percentage? That represents the percentage of the total population of voting age in North Carolina of each of those racial groups, and you'll see that those sum up to 100% at the bottom, indicating the total population. So just looking at the first row labeled black, how many black citizens are there in North Carolina and what percentage of the state's total voting age population are they? Well, reading from the table, it's approximately 1.76 million North Carolinians of voting age population, of voting age uh, are African American. And what percentage of the total voting age population are they? That's approximately 22% of the population. How about the white population in the next row? How many white people in North Carolina and what percentage of the total voting age population are they? Uh, approximately, the number is 5.9 million whites and they represent approximately 72% of the population. Okay. Moving over to the next two columns under disenfranchised, what do the N and the percentage sign there mean? Well, here we're counting up the number of people who've been disenfranchised under these policies and they're the N uh, the first end for blacks is 21,827. That's the number of black individuals who are disenfranchised under these policies, and similarly for each of the other racial categories. And how about the um, column there labeled percentage? What's that indicating? Well, that indicates the percent of the total number of people disenfranchised who come from each of the racial groups. So just looking at that first row, am I reading it correctly? There are 21,827 uh, black people disenfranchised due to community supervision, and those are 42.43% of all people disenfranchised due to community supervision? Yes, that's right. There's a total of 51,441 people disenfranchised because of state convictions and state courts, which we've been able to break down. And of those 51,000 some individuals, 21,800 and some are black. And that black population of disenfranchised people represents 42% of the total number of those disenfranchised. And can you just tell us what are the similar numbers in the second row labeled white? There are 26,000 and some whites disenfranchised and they represent approximately 52% of the total disenfranchised population. Looking at the percentages across the first two rows, that is the black and white percentages of both the total population and the disenfranchised population, do those numbers tell you anything about racial disparities in disenfranchisement? 
Well, these numbers are the very definition of a racial disparity. Blacks are 22% of the population, but 42% of those disenfranchised. And uh, it doesn't take a mathematical genius to understand that that's just about double. So blacks are vastly overrepresented among the disenfranchised compared to their share in the population. Correspondingly, whites represent 72% of the population, but just 52% of those disenfranchised. So there's an underrepresentation of whites in the disenfranchised group and an overrepresentation of blacks, which is quite, um, it's a very strong disparity, very high level of disparity. Finally, that last column labeled percent disenfranchised, what does that represent? The last column represents the percent of the relevant population group who is disenfranchised. So it calculates the percentages going across the rows. So uh, I could explain more if you want. Go ahead, please. Uh, in the first row, uh, the 21,827 blacks who are disenfranchised represent 1.24% of the total black voting age population. And so correspondingly down the rows, we can see the percent of that racial group's population who are disenfranchised, and those numbers range from very low numbers for Asian Americans uh, to higher numbers for different groups and 0.45% for whites compared to 1.24% for blacks and an overall rate of disenfranchisement across the entire state for all racial groups of 0.63%. So just looking at the first two numbers under percent disenfranchised, does that mean that 1.24% of the black voting age population in North Carolina is disenfranchised due to community supervision and 0.45% of the white voting age population is disenfranchised due to community supervision? Yes, that's exactly what the table shows. And comparing those rates, what's the ratio of black disenfranchisement rate to the white disenfranchisement rate? If we compare the, the rate of disenfranchisement for blacks, which is 1.24, divide that by the rate for whites, which is 0 0.45. The ratio is 2.76, as indicated in my report. Does that ratio of 2.76 tell us anything about racial disparities in rates of disenfranchisement between the black and white voting age populations? Yes, that single number is a summary of the degree of racial disparity. The racial, the ratio of those two numbers, if there were no disparity, the ratio would be 1.0. So the fact that the ratio is 2.76 indicates a very high degree of racial disparity. Dr. Baumgartner, according to this chart, there are more disenfranchised white people in aggregate than disenfranchised black people over 26,000 disenfranchised white people to under 22,000 disenfranchised black people. Doesn't that mean that white people are disproportionately disenfranchised compared to black people? Uh, no, it doesn't mean that white people are disproportionately um, disenfranchised compared to blacks. It means that there are more individual whites affected by these policies than there are blacks but proportionately to the size of the population, there are more blacks as a share of their population who are disenfranchised. But you're absolutely correct to note that there are more whites disenfranchised than blacks, but then again, whites are 70% of the population as the table shows. And uh, I believe you mentioned it earlier, but does the data in this table include all disenfranchised people on community supervision in North Carolina or only the people with a North Carolina state court felony conviction? Well, as you can see, the, the total N in this table is 51,441. So that's the number of, uh, of people disenfranchised because of state court convictions. It excludes the federal cases. So would you say the numbers in this chart then are under-inclusive? Yes, they include only a portion of uh, the total number of people affected by these policies. 
Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 5, which is Figure 1 from Dr. Baumgartner's report? demonstrative from the opening statement. Dr. Baumgartner, starting uh, just looking at the pie chart on the left, what is that pie chart looking at? The pie chart on the left represents a graphical, it gives a graphical representation of the population numbers that were laid out in table two. And each slice of the pie represents the share of the population that corresponds to that racial group. And how about the pie chart on the right? Pie chart on the right is a graphical representation of the numbers uh, uh, in table two referring to those who are disenfranchised. And each slice of the pie represents the share of that population of that group of the disenfranchised from each racial group. Looking at the two pie charts together, comparing them, does that tell us anything about racial disparities in disenfranchisement due to community supervision from felony convictions? Yes, it does. Looking at the two pie charts um, next to each other allows us to visualize what we already saw in Table 2. And in particular, uh, if there were no racial disparities, these two pie charts would look identical. If the ratio of, rate of racial difference was 1.0, these two pie charts would be the same. Each slice of the pie would be the same share of the relevant group or population compared to the disenfranchised. But what we see is that the red slice of the pie expands greatly. As a matter of fact, it's approximately twice as big on the right-hand uh, pie chart as it is on the left-hand one, indicating that blacks are, roughly speaking, doubly represented. They're represented at twice their rate in the population among those disenfranchised. And similarly, the blue slice of the pie represents the white individuals in North Carolina, a voting age population. And on the left-hand side, it's about three-quarters, almost three-quarters of the, of the pie. And on the right-hand pie representing those disenfranchised, it's just about half. So whites are a smaller slice, blacks are a much larger slice. That is the very definition of a racial disparity. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 6, which is Figure 2 from Dr. Baumgartner's report? What is this figure looking at? This figure is a graphical representation of the last column uh, from Table 2, the percent of the relevant racial group who is disenfranchised. And just to break it down, well, what's on the horizontal axis from left to right? The horizontal axis is a list of the different racial groups. And what's the vertical axis? The vertical axis refers to the percentage of that racial group who are disenfranchised. And that's the percentage of each race's total voting age population that's disenfranchised, right? That's right. It's the same data. It's simply a representation of the last column of data from Table 2. And it relies on the same information as was in Table 2. So can you just describe, what does the bar all the way on the far right signify? Uh, the bar on the far right represents the black uh, share of the population. And the fact that the bar height is 1.24, as indicated, shows the percentage of blacks who are disenfranchised, which is 1.24% of their voting age population across the state. What do you observe in comparing the bars for white and black? The, the bar for whites uh, has a value of 0 0.45, and the bar for blacks has a much higher value of 1.24. So that's another uh, way of representing the, the, the sharp racial disparities that are apparent no matter how we look at this data. And again, what's that ratio of the black disenfranchisement rate to the white disenfranchisement rate? The ratio of 1.25 divided by 0 0.45 is 2.76. And 
And that means that black people are disenfranchised due to community supervision at a rate 2.76 times as high as the rate of white disenfranchisement? That's what that means. The rate is 2.76 times the white rate. The rate for blacks is 2.76 times the rate for whites. Does this chart uh, tell us anything about racial disparities in disenfranchisement due to community supervision from a felony conviction? Yes, it does. It's a graphical representation that shows a very steep, uh, great degree of racial disparity. If there were no racial disparity, uh, and as you recall from Table 2, the overall rate of disenfranchisement of all North Carolinians of voting age is 0.63. If there were no racial disparities across racial groups, all of these four bars would have the same height. That height would be 0 0.63. So the fact that there are different heights shows racial differences in the impact of these policies. Dr. Baumgartner, can you sum up your conclusions regarding racial disparities in the disenfranchisement of black people and white people in North Carolina at the statewide level? Well, it's very easy to summarize. Yes, I can. Uh, the rate of disparity, the disparities by race are very, very high. Uh, no matter how we look at the data at the statewide level, blacks are disenfranchised at a much higher rate compared to whites. Uh, and that's my focus um, here today. No matter how we look at it, I think we can all see that all those disparities are very, very high. I'd like to turn to your analysis of racial demographics in the disenfranchised population at the county level. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 8, which is Table 3 from Dr. Baumgartner's report? Exhibit 8, which is Table 3. Dr. Baumgartner, uh, we'll get into the details, but just broadly, what is this table looking at? Well, if you recall from uh, the figure that we discussed previously that was figure three, I divided the counties into three groups, low, medium, and high rates of disenfranchisement. And this table breaks down uh, the counties by into those same categories of low, medium, and high rates of disenfranchisement statewide uh, across all races, and then by race, white and black. I've excluded the uh, Asian Americans and Native Americans from this table for simplicity. Okay. What do the first three columns in the table represent? Uh, those are the low, medium, and high categories of disenfranchisement from figure three before. That is, the rate of disenfranchisement is called low if it's less than 0.48%. And there's 25 such counties overall. Then the middle group has 50 counties overall, as you can see in the last row. And that's the middle rate of disenfranchisement, less than 0 0.83, but higher than 0 0.48. And then the next column is those with the relatively high rate of disenfranchisement. There's 25 counties overall in that group, greater than 0.83% of the adult population having been disenfranchised. Okay. And that's the number of counties that have low, medium, and high rates of disenfranchisement of the total voting age population in the county, the bottom row on the chart, right? Yes, the bottom row indicates the totals across all people, no matter their race, and you can see that the numbers are 25, 50, and 25. Okay, now let's go to the first row for the white population. What do each of the numbers in, those row, in, the, in that row convey to us? They show the number of counties that disenfranchise whites at the different rates, low, medium, and high. And the number 53 indicates that there are 53 counties that disenfranchise fewer than 0.48% of the white adult voting age population. And so for 37 counties, exclude whites from the franchise at the, in the middle category, 0.48 to 0.83%. And then there are 10 counties in North Carolina that disenfranchise 
more than 0.83% of their white population. Now, how about the second row for the black population? Well, the second row breaks the counties into the exact same categories of low, medium, and high, and it shows the distribution across the disenfranchisement rates for the black population. So there we see just two counties have a low rate of disenfranchisement for blacks, less than 0.48%. 15 counties fall into the middle category, and 77 counties fall into the high category disenfranchising more than 0.83% of their black population. Comparing the first and third columns, that is the low disenfranchisement counties and the high disenfranchisement counties for the white and black populations, does that comparison tell us anything about racial disparities in disenfranchisement due to community supervision from felony convictions? Well, if we look at the, the distribution, uh, the number of uh, counties with low rates of disenfranchisement for whites and blacks, we see a comparison of 53 counties for whites and two counties for blacks. And if we look at the high category, we see that 10 counties fall into the high category for their white population, but 77 counties disenfranchise what we've called the high percentage of their black population. So these are very stark differences by race across the counties. That fourth column indicates insufficient data on the black population for six counties. What does that mean? The United States Census uh, doesn't release data broken down by race for counties uh, where there's fewer than 400 people of that race. So the, the six counties that are indicated, I believe, right in the figure that you can see, Allegheny County, Clay, Graham, Mitchell, Swain, and Yancey counties have fewer than 400 African Americans in the adult population. So the census doesn't uh, report the actual number. So those numbers are excluded, and that's what the insufficient data refers to. Can we pull up? Plaintiff's Exhibit 9, which is Figure 4 from Dr. Baumgartner's report. And let's start by zooming in on the graph on the, graph on the left, labeled White Disenfranchisement Rates. Dr. Baumgartner, broadly, what is this graph looking at? This is a graph that shows the number of counties that have the different rates of disenfranchising their white populations. It uses the same format as a previous exhibit, which was my figure uh, three. So just as a reminder, what does the horizontal axis on this graph represent? It's the percent of the relevant population who are disenfranchised. And you can see that it ranges from zero at the left. Doctor, sorry, what, what was the... Is this someone's cell phone? All right. Got to take care of, sir. Turned off. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Doctor. If you could start back with your answer from the beginning. Thank you. The the question was just, what is this graph uh, looking at? This is a graph that um, shows the percentage of the white population, the number of counties that disenfranchise different rates of their what uh, the dis disenfranchise whites at different rates. And, what does, and you were telling us, what does the horizontal axis represent? The horizontal axis is the percentage of the white population that is disenfranchised. And you can see that it ranges from 0% on the left up to a maximum of 5. But the data uh, don't go that far. And again, what does the vertical axis represent? The vertical axis is the number of counties. And each bar in the graph represents how many counties fall into that bin or that range of disenfranchisement for their white population. So this is similar to the figure we looked at earlier, except instead of rates of disenfranchisement for the entire voting age population in counties, this graph is looking at the rates of disenfranchisement 
for only the white voting age population in counties. That's right. This uses the exact same uh, methodology and presentation as the previous graph that was for the total population, but this zooms in to that subset, which is just the white population and the white rates of disenfranchisement. So let's take an example. That gray bar farthest to the right at about 1.25%, what does that bar tell us? That tells us that there are two counties in North Carolina that have a rate of disenfranchisement for their white population that is approximately 1.2% of that population. And what's the highest rate of white disenfranchisement in any county in North Carolina? Well, the bars that we just referred to, those that, that has a height of two, uh, represents the extreme right-hand value on that figure. So that is the maximum value, which I believe is 1.2. So there's no county in North Carolina that disenfranchises more than 1.2% of its white voting age population? There is no county in North Carolina that disenfranchises more than 1.2% of its voting age population among whites. And how about those two vertical lines in the text that says lower than 0.48 and higher than 0.83? What do those lines mean? Well, if you recall the low, medium, and high categories that I established at the beginning of this conversation, uh, those vertical lines are represented in the chart they're just thin vertical lines. And then we can see the number of bars that fall to the left, that fall in, the, in between the two vertical lines that fall to the right of the rightmost vertical line. That's 53 counties fall to the left in the, in the low category, uh, and 10 counties fall in the right. Um, and from table three, I could tell you that there are 37 counties that fall in the middle. So just looking and observing the placement of the bars on this graph, what do you see? Well, this graph skews left. This graph, uh, compared to um, the overall graph that we saw previously in figure three, shows that the, across the 100 counties of North Carolina, the typical rate of disenfranchisement for whites is um, about one half of one percent, roughly speaking, just eyeballing the graph, and that there is no county in North Carolina that disenfranchises more than 1.2 percent of its white population. Indeed, there's uh, just one more that has greater than one percent. Okay. Let's zoom in now on the bar graph on the right, labeled black disenfranchisement rates. What's this looking at? This is the identical uh, presentation of data showing the rates of disenfranchisement for the black population across the 100 counties, although, again, six counties had insufficient data, so there are 94 counties represented in this graph, uh, as I described before. And those two vertical lines over towards the left side of the graph do those represent the same three buckets of low, medium, and high rates of disenfranchisement of the black voting age population in counties? Yes, throughout this analysis, I've tried to keep, I've kept the same um, categories of low, medium, and high. And you can see that here in this presentation for the black population, there's just two counties that fall below the left hand line. Um, and there are 77 counties, that is the vast majority of counties that fall into the high category of disenfranchisement for the black population. In general, what do you observe about the placement of the bars on this graph? Well, this graph skews right. This graph shows, on average, a much higher rate of disenfranchisement uh, consistently across the 94 counties uh, the graph by itself um, shows that there's a number of counties with greater than 2% of the black population being disenfranchised, 
and very, very few counties with very low rates of disenfranchisement. So it's important to keep in mind the previous graph and compare the two. Um, whereas the, the graph showing the white disenfranchisement rate skewed left and had a very low average and many, many counties falling in the lowest categories of the graph. There are no counties at the very left-hand side of this graph. And the graph extends far to the right where the corresponding graph for whites was completely barren, blank of any observations. For whites, there were no observations greater than 1.2. And for blacks, the average North Carolina county has more than 1.2% of the black population disenfranchised. So this shows, this is another representation of the very stark racial disparities in these data. There are a number of gray bars to the right of 2%. What does that mean? So each, uh, on the horizontal axis, uh, each placement indicates the percent of the black population who are disenfranchised. So if the placement is at two, three, four, or higher than two, it means that uh, there's greater than 2% of the black population who are disenfranchised in that county. Do you know how many counties are there where more than 2% of the entire black voting age population is disenfranchised due to community supervision? There are 19 counties in North Carolina where more than 2% of the population of blacks is disenfranchised under these policies. There are four bars to the right of 3% on this graph. What does that mean? Those represent the counties that disenfranchise the corresponding share of their black population being more than 3% disenfranchised. How many counties are there in North Carolina that disenfranchise more than 3% of their entire black voting age population? There are four such counties. And what about that gray bar farthest out to the right past 5%? What does that bar mean? It represents one county that has the highest rate of disenfranchisement for its black population, uh, which is, I believe, 5.4% of the black population being disenfranchised. So that's the maximum value across the 94 counties where we have data on the black disenfranchisement rate. It would be comparable to the maximum value for the white disenfranchisement rate, which is 1.2. So the maximum value for blacks is 5.4, where the maximum value that we observed for whites was 1.2. In practical terms, what does it mean for over 5% of the entire black voting age population in that county to be disenfranchised? Well, if we think about um, the overall rate of disenfranchisement in North Carolina under these policies, it's, it's approximately uh, six tenths of one percent, 0.62 from my earlier table. So the fact that there is a county with a disenfranchisement rate of blacks of five percent, that's almost ten times greater than the statewide average. So I would say that it's a clear demonstration of a very stark racial disparity. Are there any counties that have comparably high rates of white disenfranchisement? There are no counties that come close. The highest rate of white disenfranchisement is 1.2 percent. Can we zoom back out so we see the graphs together? Looking at the graphs on the left and right together for the white disenfranchisement rate in counties and black disenfranchisement rates in counties, does that comparison tell us anything about racial disparities and disenfranchisement due to community supervision from felony convictions? Yes, it does. Comparing the two graphs gives an easy visual demonstration of the disparities that we've been discussing. If there were no racial disparities, these two figures would be mirror images of each other. They would look identical. So the fact that the one image is skewed off to the right and the other image is skewed off to the left is just a 
graphical representation of the degree of racial disparity across the 100 counties for whites and the 94 counties for blacks where we have sufficient data. And we'll get into the details in a little while, but are the raw numbers behind these charts included in your report? Yes, I wanted to make clear that in my report, in Table A1, the appendix table to my report lists all of the raw numbers. That's the actual population values, the raw counts of how many people are disenfranchised. And then in my Table A2, it shows the percentages that we're referring to here. So anyone that was interested in the raw numbers could look up in Table A1 to get the counts, and in Table A2 to get the percentages that that underlie all the analyses that I've done here. And we'll take a look at those in more detail in a little while. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 10, which is Figure 5 from Dr. Baumgartner's report? Broadly speaking, what is this figure looking at? Well, this is another illustration of the same data that we've been discussing and which are laid out in detail in the, those appendix tables I just referred to. This is called a box and whisker plot, and it shows for the white and black populations the distribution of observations across the counties showing their rates of disenfranchisement for the white population on the left and the black population on the right. Looking at the left column labeled white, what does that gray box represent? In a box and whisker plot, the, the central box represents uh, the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile of the observations. So moving, counting from the bottom to the top of the graph, moving from lower to higher, uh, the bottom of that gray box represents the value corresponding to the 25th county and then the top of the box corresponds to the 75th county if one sorted them all in order of their rates of disenfranchisement of whites. So would those be the counties that you categorized as having the medium rate of disenfranchisement of their white population? The way I calculated, if you recall, from um, figure three was 50 counties in the middle constituted that middle category. The 25 counties uh, with the lowest rates of uh, disenfranchisement counted, uh, constituted the low category, below 0.48, and the 25 counties that had the highest rates, above 0.83. Uh, so those, of course, just by coincidence, North Carolina has exactly 100 counties. So uh, those bins correspond to the percentile rankings. So they, um, so that is exactly what they correspond to. How about that horizontal line inside the gray box? What does that represent? That shows the median value or the 50th percentile or the average county, the middle county. How about those two horizontal lines that are above and below the gray box? What are those? Well, in a box and whisker plot, the horizontal lines that extend outward represent the last contiguous value. And what about those dots? It looks like there are two dots nearly on top of each other above the, at the top of the uh, box and whisker pot for the white population. What are those? The outline, those are called outlier cases. And so those, those lay outside of the contiguous uh, area. And if you recall from the previous figures that we were just looking at, there were two counties with uh, 1 1.2, approximately 1.2% disenfranchisement for the white population. And there weren't any counties in the immediate adjacent uh, area. So those are the outlier cases with the highest rates of disenfranchisement for whites. What do you observe in comparing the gray box and horizontal line for white disenfranchisement on the left compared to black disenfranchisement on the right? Well, again, this is a representation of something that's um, very obvious, that there's a very great racial disparity in these data. Um, looking at this representation of the same underlying data, for example, one can see that 
there is no overlap between the central areas, the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile of the white uh, part of the graph on the left does not overlap at all with the corresponding area for the, in the black, uh, for blacks. Similarly, the median value for blacks is higher than the maximum value for whites. That means that the average county in North Carolina, the median county, the 50th percentile, excludes from voting a higher share of its black voting age population than any county in North Carolina excludes of its white population. So this is another representation of the same data that shows a very stark racial disparity. What about those two dots uh, at the top of the plot for the black population on the right? What do those signify? Those signify the outlier counties that have the highest rates of disenfranchisement for blacks, um, over 5% in one case, and uh, approximately four, just under 4% for the second observation. If there were no racial disparity in black and white disenfranchisement rates across North Carolina counties, what would you expect this figure to look like? Uh, if there were no racial disparities in the rates of disenfranchisement, these two plots would be mirror images of each other. The median values would be at the same height, the 25th and 75th um, percentile uh, boxes would be the same and uh, they would be perfect mirror images. How does that compare to what you actually observe in this figure five? Well, I think any of us can see that uh, these are not mirror images of each other. The, the plot on the right is dramatically different than the plot on the left. It shows consistently higher rates of disenfranchisement for blacks than what we see for whites across 94 counties where we have data on the black population. Can we pull up plaintiff's exhibit 11, which is figure six from Dr. Baumgartner's report? to break this one down into pieces as well, but just for starters, what is this figure looking at? Well, this is called a scatter plot, and it represents another way of visualizing uh, the rates of disenfranchisement for the two racial groups. At the individual county level? Each dot on this plot represents a county. And it... Okay, so each dot on this Scatter plot represents a different county in North Carolina. How about the horizontal axis from left to right? From left to right, what we see is the rate at which each county um, disenfranchises uh, whites. And what about the vertical axis going from bottom to top? Well, you notice that that axis is on a different scale. It goes from 1 to 3, where the other one goes only from 1 to 1 1.5. and the y-axis or the vertical axis represents the rate at which the black adult population is disenfranchised. Okay. There's a line there labeled 1x. What does that line labeled 1x represent? The line labeled 1x represents racial equality. It represents the, the rate at which, if there were no racial difference, all of these observations would fall if the rate of exclusion of blacks from the vote was identical to the rate of exclusion of whites. All of the observations would fall directly on that line labeled 1x. So that line labeled 1x is where a dot would fall for any county where the white and black rates of disenfranchisement are equal? That's correct. If the rate of disenfranchisement for whites was equal to the rate of disenfranchisement for blacks, then they would fall exactly on that line. So if the rate was 0 0.5 for both races, it would be at 0 0.5. If it was 2% for each race equally, it would be at 2%. It would be the same exactly on that line. 
If the dot is above the line, what does that tell us? If it's above the 1x line, it indicates that the rate of disenfranchisement of blacks is higher than the rate of disenfranchisement for whites. If a dot were below that line labeled 1x, what would that mean? That would indicate that the rate of disenfranchisement for blacks was lower than the rate of disenfranchisement for whites. Do you see any such counties? There are no such counties included in this figure. What does it mean that all the dots in this scatter plot are above the line labeled 1x? It means that every county in North Carolina where we can estimate these values excludes more blacks proportionately from the vote under these policies than it excludes whites. Putting aside counties that you didn't include on this chart for reasons we'll discuss shortly, are there any counties in North Carolina where you found the white disenfranchisement rate greater than the black disenfranchisement rate? There are no counties in North Carolina where that was true. How about the line labeled 4x? What does that line labeled 4x represent? The line labeled 4x represents the value where the black rate of disenfranchisement is four times as great as the white rate. So if the white rate is 0 0.5, the black rate four times that would be 2.0. And if you use your eye and move directly vertical from 0 0.5, and you reach the point where you see the graph, the line 4x, and then go to the left, you'll see that you're at the point of 2.0, four times higher, four times as great as the white value. So if a dot falls on that line labeled 4x, it means that in that county, the rate of black disenfranchisement is four times as high as the rate of white disenfranchisement? That's right. 4x means that it's four times greater. Four, four times is great. How many counties fall above that line where the black disenfranchisement rate is over four times greater than the white disenfranchisement rate? And I'll point you to page 15 of your report to save you time counting dots. Uh, there's 24 counties where the rate of disenfranchising blacks is four times greater or higher than that, according to this figure. How about the line labeled 5x? What does that line represent? Well, just like the 4x line represented four times the rate, this represents five times the rate of excluding blacks from the vote compared to excluding whites from the vote through these policies. So if it dot and fell, Jones, just a minute. I think I don't know if the microphone's going out. I can still hear, but it is this better? Know. Maybe it ha does it relate to leaning forward or not? Can you all hear him okay? Or? I can, Your Honor, but it does fade in and I think it does. Oh, okay, okay. okay, maybe I'll just try to sit back. Or do you want to move it to your tie? Sometimes that's. Is that a little bit better? I don't feel like there's amplification. Yeah, maybe come in now. I mean, I can, I can hear you, but... Um, is there something to adjust on that? I don't know. Yeah. Is there a volume? You got a volume up here. Yeah. 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 Maybe that'll work better? That's Much good. closer? Okay. I'm sorry for that. No, that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds better to me. Can you hold your... There's no point in me being here if you can't hear what I'm saying, so thank you, Your Honor. Sorry, Mr. Jones, you want to start back with that question? Please? Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, we were looking, Dr. Baumgartner, at the line labeled 5x, and, and just to reiterate, if a dot fell on that line labeled 5x, that would be a county where the black population is disenfranchised at a rate five times greater than the disenfranchisement rate for the white population, is that correct? Yes, the line labeled 5x indicates those counties where the black rate of disenfranchisement is five times as great as the white rate. How many counties are there in North Carolina that fall above that line labeled 5x where the black disenfranchisement rate is 
more than five times greater than the white disenfranchisement rate? There are eight counties that fall to the left of that line, disenfranchising more than five times greater their black population share than the white population share. What about that red line labeled 2.7x? What does that represent? The red line represents what's called the regression line, or the line of uh, best fit. And I would say that one thing to note about these data is that they do um, cluster and that some counties have low rates of disenfranchisement for both blacks and whites. Some have higher rates for both groups. And the best description of the relationship between the white rate and the black rate is that on average across these counties, the black rate is 2.7 times the white rate. And you can see that the red line goes through the center of the cluster of dots in the scatter plot, and so it is the mathematical center of that distribution. And it describes what that relationship is. Dr. Baumgartner, are there any counties that you excluded from this chart? Yes, as laid out in the note to the chart and also in the footnote in my report in some detail, there's this chart includes only 84 counties, and I excluded a greater number of counties because of the difficulty of uh, estimating, getting a robust estimate of the number of blacks disenfranchised in some counties where very few blacks live. And can you just explain from a statistical perspective, why did you exclude those counties? Well, if you read through the appendix table number one, you'll see there's a column of data that shows the number of blacks who are disenfranchised. And because of the distribution of the population in North Carolina, there are some counties where, let's say, there's only 600 blacks who live in that county. The number of blacks in that county who might be disenfranchised could be just a handful. Five, six, there's some counties in North Carolina where just one black person is disenfranchised. And um, in order to have a robust and have confidence in a robust estimate, um, it's customary and good statistical practice not to analyze data based on handfuls of cases because there could be a fluky, stochastic, random, idiosyncratic reason why that one might be a two. Or that is somebody just re was removed from probation the day before we collected the data, or they just arrived on probation the day before or the week before. So there would be slight idiosyncrasies, slight changes. Whereas for a county like Mecklenburg County, with hundreds of people in this class, the movement of one or two people, one way or another, would not have a significant impact on any rate that we might calculate. So I was careful to exclude the observations that were based on just a handful of cases. And that ended up excluding 16 cases, as I explained in detail in the footnote to this table, and as is on the exhibit right now. So the footnote in your report discloses the counties you excluded and explains why you excluded them? It does. If you had included those 16 counties on this chart, would it have changed the conclusions you drew? The chart, it would not have changed, no it would not. It would not have changed the conclusions that I drew. It would simply make the chart spread out a little bit in both directions. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 12, which is Figure 7 from Dr. Baumgartner's report? Again, we'll break this chart down into pieces, but for starters, what is this figure looking at? Well, this is called a horizontal bar chart, and it compares for the same 84 counties that we've just been discussing. Uh, the ratio of the disenfranchisement rate for blacks compared to the disenfranchisement rate for whites. And it lists each of the counties by name. And it lists them in order from the lowest ratio at the top to the highest ratio at the bottom. Okay, so on the vertical axis from 
top to bottom, I can see the list of county names. What is the what is represented on the horizontal axis from left to right? The horizontal axis is the ratio of the disenfranchisement rates. It's the white it's, it's the black disenfranchisement rate divided by the white disenfranchisement rate, or the ratio of those two numbers. There's a vertical line right at a, a black-white disenfranchisement ratio of, of one, going from top to bottom. What does that vertical black line at one represent? The vertical black line at one represents racial equality. It represents the situation where the white rate of disenfranchisement is equal to the black rate of disenfranchisement. Okay, let's look at a couple of examples. Starting with the very top horizontal bar for Gates County. What does that show? I believe the number there is 1.03 for Gates County. So what that means is that the rate of disenfranchising blacks is just 3% higher than the rate of disenfranchising whites. So that figure therefore falls almost exactly on the 1.0 line representing racial equality. In Gates County, the two rates of disenfranchisement are very close to each other. Okay, now let's go down to the very bottom of this chart, the bottom bar for Orange County. What does that show? Orange County shows a value, a rate of 7.82, which means that the rate of disenfranchising blacks in that county is almost eight times the rate of disenfranchising whites. Staying on Orange County, what does that ratio of 7.82 mean in, in practical terms? In practical terms, if we had a room of 100 white people living in my home county of Orange and 100 blacks, and then we asked from those two rooms all the people under uh, disenfranchisement because of these policies to move into another room, that other room would have eight blacks and just one white individual move into that room. So we would move from a, a two rooms of racial equality into a subset that is almost all black, eight to one. Dr. Baumgartner, can you just walk us through the, the bottom five bar bars on the chart one by one, uh, starting with Orange County? Yes, I'd be glad to, and let me remind everybody that the raw numbers that lead to these ratios are listed out in the appendix table. So um, in Orange County, the rate of disenfranchising blacks compared to the rate of disenfranchising whites is greater by 7.8. In Mecklenburg County, the rate of disenfranchising blacks is 7.26 times the rate of disenfranchisement for the white population in Mecklenburg County. In Buncombe County, the rate of disenfranchising blacks is almost seven times the rate of disenfranchising whites in that county. In Wake County, the rate of disenfranchising blacks is over six times the rate of disenfranchisement for whites. In Durham County, the rate of disenfranchising blacks is almost six times the rate of disenfranchising whites. And you can see the precise numbers in the graph. You touched on it earlier, but if there were no racial disparity in the white and black disenfranchisement rates across North Carolina counties, what would you expect this chart to look like? If there were no racial disparities across the counties in their rates of disenfranchising, all of these bars would be at the 1.0 line of racial equity. If there were some random fluctuation, which would not be surprising in such a policy, then the bars would be slightly to the left or slightly to the right of the 1.0 line representing racial equality or equity but there would be an equal number of those to the left and an equal number of those to the right. 
So if it were perfectly mathematically equal, all the countings would be right at the 1.0 line. If there was some stochastic or random variance, as is common in social statistics, then there would be an equal number to the left and an equal number to the right, but the mean, the mean value, the median value, and the average county would have a ratio of 1.0. How does that compare to what you actually observe in this figure? What we observe in the figure, and you can see it by coming halfway down uh, from the vertical, from Gates County, go halfway down, and then go out to the right, you'll see that the, the median county in North Carolina has a value of approximately three. And there are no counties that go to the left of the line of racial equity. This is the same as what we saw in the presentation of the data with the scatter plot. There were no counties at that 1x line, and none to the left of the 1x line. There were two counties that were very close to it. These are the two counties in this presentation that are at the very top of this chart, showing values close to 1.0. But none, none of the 84 counties listed here goes to the left of that line and many of them extend far out to the right, as I indicated with Buncombe, Mecklenburg, Orange, Wake, Durham counties. And I would point out that these are not small counties. There's no statistical fluke associated with any of these data, particularly the ones with the extremely high ratios of disenfranchisement. Mecklenburg and Wake counties are the two largest counties in the state by population. These are robust numbers. Dr. Baumgartner, looking at this figure as a whole, does it tell us anything about racial disparities in the rates of disenfranchisement among blacks and whites due to community supervision from felony convictions? Yes, it does. And it tells the same story as um, I've told in the previous figures. I know I sound like a broken record, but these figures are telling something that's very consistent, and they tell it over and over again, which is that the racial disparities that we observe following from these policies are very great, and also they're ubiquitous across the state. This chart shows ratios of, of four, five, six, or even seven. Uh, those sound like big numbers, but they're actually comparing disenfranchisement percentages that are much smaller, sometimes just a fraction of, a, of 1%. Is that a valid statistical methodology to compare um, small percentages like that to derive a ratio? Yes, if, if something happens um, one time in a million and something else happens one time in a thousand, those are small rates but one of them is happening much more frequently than the other. So while it is a small rate, none of these observations, and you can see from table A1 in the appendix, none of these observations are based on low absolute numbers. That's the reason why there's only 84 counties included here rather than all 100 or 94 with census data for blacks. So while they are low rates, um, it's, it's still a reasonable practice to compare those rates even if they might be less than one. The overall rate is 0 0.6. So we're dealing with things that are not happening to all of us. They're happening to 0.6% of all North Carolinians of voting age are uh, disenfranchised through these policies. So 1.25% of blacks and 0.46% of whites, that's a comparison that somebody might say well, those are low numbers but it's still 51,000 people. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 13, which is figure 8A from Dr. Baumgartner's report? <coughs> what is this map showing? This is a map of the counties of North Carolina showing the total rate of disenfranchisement, and it corresponds to the data that were laid out in my first figure three. The shading represents the low, medium, and high categories that were laid out in that conversation. So when you say this map is showing the total 
population disenfranchised, that means the total voting age population, not any specific race. That's right. This is the 51,441 individuals who are disenfranchised as a percentage of the total population across all races in each county. And, and you referred to it a moment ago. Um, setting aside the specific numbers for a moment, what do the three different shades of color on this map represent? Well, as you recall, previously I laid out a distinction between low, medium, and high rates of disenfranchisement across the entire uh, population. Um, and so the shades represent those three categories. There should be 50 observations here with the middle category. 25 with the lightest shade and 25 with the darker shade of blue. So darker shading in a county means a higher rate of disenfranchisement? The darker shade represents the high category for disenfranchisement and the lighter shade represents lower rates of disenfranchisement. Okay, you, you explained that this map is looking at the percentage of the total voting age population that's disenfranchised in each county. Did you also prepare similar color-coded maps looking at the white and black disenfranchisement rates in each county? Yes, I did. I prepared those maps as well as the Asian American and the Native American populations, and those are reflected in my report. Dr. Baumgartner, I noticed that in the legend there, it doesn't list the same numbers, the cut points you mentioned earlier for low, medium, and high rates of disenfranchisement. In your earlier figure, low meant below 0.48% and high meant above 0.83% with medium anything in between. This legend says 0.38% and 0.62%. Why is that? Uh, well, that's a mistake. Did you prepare new versions of these color-coded maps fixing that issue and include them in an erratum to your original report last week? Yes, I did. In preparing for my testimony here, I noticed that those um, cut points were not consistent with the rest of my report, and so I immediately made new maps using the consistent categories. Can we pull up Plaintiff's Exhibit 174, which is Dr. Baumgartner's erratum? Do you recognize this, Dr. Baumgartner, as the erratum you prepared last week with new versions of all your color-coded maps? Yes, that's the copy of my report, my erratum, from the end last, uh, whenever, August 12th. I don't believe Scroll. this one, I'm sorry, I don't think this one was delivered electronically, is that right? So we only have the, we don't have it in our zip drives. Oh, okay. We emailed a cop an electronic copy last week, uh, but we can send it again if that's helpful. I just want to make sure we weren't missing something. But we, you have it on your screen, Judge? Yeah. Is it on your screen? I have it on the screen, but I okay. don't have it. Yeah. I have it on the screen. So have it. All right. We, all, we have it on the screen, but we'll, we'll follow up with um, Ms. Myers about getting the email copy. Okay. And if it's helpful, just let us know. We're, we're happy to send another um, okay. Yeah. Do the maps in this erratum uh, correct the issue you described with the numerical cut points, and do they accurately color code each county according to the relevant disenfranchisement rates? Uh, yes, these corrected maps um, accurate, use the same cut points and label them accurately, and then they correspond as well to the data that are in Table uh, A2 in my report. Um, the raw data are all presented there. So all of the underlying raw data for the maps was always included in the appendices to your report? All of the data is in the um, Appendix A1 for the raw numbers and Appendix A2 for the percentage calculation. So anyone could use that raw data to check and confirm that all the color coding on the maps is accurate? That's correct. Can we zoom in on figure 8C labeled white? And we have a demonstrative for this that we'd also like to put up.
So that would be really set now. See, I pull that. Thank you. Period course stands a recess. 15 minutes. Yeah, I'm going to sleep right here now. I'm going to turn it off just to the safe battery.